It's a late night, and a pair of legendary computer wizards receive a phone call from their boss. What he asks of them is impossible. To build a computer that will change the destiny of an entire generation in one week. But what none of them known is that this will be only the beginning. That this will start a chain of events that will get a small group of Cambridge visionaries to set the basis for a technology that would likely affect the lives of every person on Earth. This is that story. It's the second half of the 70s in Cambridge, the United Kingdom, and company co-founders Herman Hauser and Chris Curry are trying to figure out how to get their tiny company into some big projects. Chris Curry had, until very recently, been second in command at a local consumer electronics company called Sinclair Radionics, led by the legendary Clive Sinclair, which we already covered in a past video with its own set of weird and slightly violent shenanigans. But at the moment, if their intent was to get into the world of microprocessors and home computers, they needed something important. Talent. Talented technicians that will make their computer dreams come true. And lucky for them, Herman knew exactly where the best talent pool was. The legendary institution that is the University of Cambridge. And within this university, there was one specific club that was of particular interest to them. The Cambridge University Processor Group. A society of nerds fascinated with the up-and-coming world of processors and the home computer revolution. After asking around, he was introduced to the most talented students of the group, a PhD student called Steve Ferber and a shockingly young undergrad, the one and only Sophie Wilson. Ferber was knee-deep in his PhD on aerodynamics and had developed a wealth of mathematical knowledge, and Wilson, for her part, was the resident tech wizard. Her fascination for microprocessors had begun after a few friends told her about a shockingly cheap microprocessor that had just came into the market, the MOS 6502. And with the new talent now under their wings, they set out to make some money. Chris, having observed the growth of Apple computers, was inspired to choose a name that will put them on top of Apple in the phone book, and that will refer to an old English saying, Big Oaks from Small Acorns Grow. And Acorn Computers was about to start growing into a mighty tree. 1980. As a new decade rolls around, things in Acorn Computers are heating up. Yes, a fully packaged, plug-and-play, ready-to-use home computer like the companies in the United States are making. No more kits for enthusiasts to put together. We can put a beautiful case around our computers and make it happen. A case? Chris, how in the world are we going to finance any of this? We don't have the money for that level of a production run. Don't worry, we're going to make one, take some nice pictures, put a full-page ad on the best electronics magazine of the country, and people are going to love it so much they're going to send us checks for pre-orders. We will have the funds for production in no time. This sell-first, produce-later methodology is something that Curry had learned from his old boss Sinclair, and while Hauser was dubious, the growing computer market in the UK loved it. And soon, they had the funds to make the Acorn Atom, a completely pre-built and pre-packaged home computer, designed around Wilson's preferred MOS 6502 and powered by Acorn Basic, a highly powerful interpreter for the basic programming language that Wilson herself had programmed. And with extra features like network capabilities and the ability to mix machine code with basic instructions, it was in many ways superior to the Microsoft Basic most of the industry will come to rely on. Even while competing with the likes of the ZX80 from Chris Boss, the product found some modest success. But as the employees of the still small company discuss what to produce next, they find themselves in an unexpected disagreement. Should we build workstations? Computers are going to be huge in the workspace. Workstations? Look at all the atoms we sold. We should definitely make another home computer for regular people. How about this? I can design a computer that uses two microprocessors. One microprocessor would be connected to the I.O. and sold as a home computer, but when connected to the second microprocessor, it becomes a much more powerful machine that could be used as a workstation. Wow! You can do that? And so, development started on the next project. They will take the first half of Sophie's idea and turn it into a home computer codename Proton, with future plans of selling the other half as an expansion to turn it into a powerful workstation. But the timeline of this project was about to get radically shorter thanks to an unexpected organization that would change everything for the country. BBC, the public broadcaster of the UK, was producing a TV program to educate the general public about computers. 
There was no unifying operating system back then. Computers were a mess of mutually incompatible systems with somewhat unique quirks. So for the program to function, the BBC needed a single flagship computer to center the program around. And this presented an opportunity. Everyone in the UK's computer industry understood what this meant. Whoever got this juicy government contract would get millions of pounds in free publicity and millions of computer sold to schools and universities. Curry's old boss, Clive Sinclair, had jumped at this with his trademark cockiness, presenting the Sinclair ZX81 as the obvious runner for this competition. But the flat keyboard, lack of expansion capabilities, and the general attitude from Sinclair had turned the BBC off right away. And Chris smelled an opportunity to again sell first and execute later. Our next computer is exactly what you asked for. Lots of expansions and ports, a high quality keyboard, high performance. We can easily adapt our Proton to whatever the BBC needs. Can we visit the office to see it next week? Next up, uh, next week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, we will be ready. Now, the problem with this promise is that the Proton was at best on the idea stage. And to convince the team to pull off the insanity of implementing a prototype in a week, they will almost need a miracle. But Hauser had an idea on how to stimulate his workers, something that will become a bit of a legend in tech history circles. And to tell the story, I thought it appropriate to have someone that was there. This was um, quite late in, in, in the negotiations with the BBC. Planned a visit to Acorn on Friday, and uh, this telephone call happened the weekend before that Friday. We hadn't even designed it. I mean, I, I had a paper design for the machine, but, but not a detailed design. Herman rang Sophie and said, Hey Wilson, can you create a prototype of the Proton by the end of the week for the BBC to check? End of the week? Are you crazy? That's impossible. Huh, that's weird. Ferber said he could. Wait, he... what? Um, maybe he knows something I don't. Uh, okay then? And then Herman rang me and said, Hey Steve, can you create a prototype of the Proton by the end of the week? A week? Are you drunk, Herman? Wilson said it was doable. What? Well, maybe. So, no, I, I, you know, it's a long time ago, so I don't trust my own memory and the finer details, but certainly something like that happened. It took the pair a bit to realize the ruse, but it was too late. They were knee deep into the project. What followed was one of the most intense weeks in the history of computer development, as the entire team crunched to get the prototype ready in time for the BBC visit. And so they work up to the last seconds, with Wilson literally programming the last bits of the CRT controller as Curry and Hauser delayed the BBC from coming up the stairs. But the BBC was so impressed that this ragtag team had done more progress in a week than other companies had done in years that they awarded them the multi-million pound government contract. Now, with proper time and money, the prototype needed to turn into a complete product. The massive amount of chips used by this computer needed to be simplified, with the help of a couple of semi-custom chips built using what was called gate arrays, where the chips had a bunch of pre-made electronic components, and then a layer of connections was designed to turn them into a semi-custom circuit. A lot of responsibility will fall into Ferber, who, under pressure, will turn out to be a particularly skilled circuit designer. Um, Yes, the, B the BBC Micro was launched with two Ferranti ULAs, one for the uh, video system and one for the uh, serial interface, and cassette interface and, uh, and so on. Long-time viewers might remember Ferranti, as it was the same technology and the same company that made Sinclair computers possible. And they were also the subject of a SideQuest video, but this time around, the technology brought forward some issues. And the serial interface chip worked fine. But the video processor, the vidproc as we called it, um, gave us all sorts of problems. Uh, it was quite temperature sensitive. The problem was that the video processor was running at speeds which were quite close to the limits of the technology. One of the characteristics of BBC Micro was that was it would work fine when you turned it on, but sort of 10 minutes later it would it would heat up and then you'd start getting pixel breakup on the screen due to the video processor. And so they were saved by a second source of a similar technology, BLSI, an American company. They use a different fabrication technology that was way more resistant to overheating, and they will turn out to be a powerful ally soon enough. 
all the pieces were in place to power the new computer that will be called the BBC Micro. The official computer for the BBC's educational program that will sell millions and turned into a platform that will teach the entire UK population about computers. But if you remember earlier in the video, what had been proposed was a two-part computer, where the BBC Micro was just the first part, ready to be connected to a second processor to turn into a powerful workstation. And now that they had the money, the momentum and the name to do the second part, as they started experimenting with connecting a second processor to the micro, they discovered something unexpected. Newer and supposedly superior processors like the Motorola 6800 and the National Semiconductor 32016 were super complicated devices with extensive instruction sets. Wilson and Ferber had even traveled to the National Semiconductor Laboratory in Israel and were surprised by the complex and fully staffed facilities needed to make this piece. Uh, Israel um, was pretty much what you expect, a large American company with a large setup and a large team that, that having repeated problems debugging. And yet, in reality, the practical improvements they offered in performance were minimal, especially in terms of being able to make use of faster memory. The one test that actually gave them any positive results was just another 6502 running on a faster clock. Were they missing something? Given this result, all hopes were placed on a successor to the 6502. As Wilson and Ferber traveled to Arizona to visit the labs of Western Digital Center, directed by one of the original design members of the 6502, specifically this guy from a previous video, they were surprised to discover something different. Yes, that, that was really quite interesting. Um, we, you know, we went to Phoenix, Arizona, to the Western Design Center, so-called, um, expecting to find you know, classic shiny American offices with big glass windows. And what we discovered was the Western Design Center was operating out of a, a bungalow in, in the Arizona suburbs. Um, and they were using uh, school pupils to, do, to design basic uh, gate cells and so on, on, on Apple computers. Their whole operation was less sophisticated than anything Acorn had. Maybe they had seriously overestimated the technical capabilities necessary to create a simple microprocessor. So what if, what if they could design their own microprocessor that will finally satisfy them? As the idea was communicated with the rest of the team back home, Hauser realized that he had recently read something that fit perfectly into this issue. Uh, what is this? I've been tracking papers and press releases coming out of Berkeley and Stanford on a new approach for processor design. The approach was, of course, the reduced instruction set computer. The idea that instead of making increasingly complex processors with lots of instructions, make something similar with a smaller but much faster set of simple instructions, and then use those simple instructions to build complex ones for a much simpler and faster design. And simpler instructions meant a simple processor that could be designed by a small team. Oh my god, they could actually pull this off. They could design a chip just like they did for the chips on the BBC Micro and have BLSI technologies fabricate them. Still believing that they would run into some inevitable roadblock, the team got busy into designing what they codenamed ARM. Acorn Resk Machine. Yes, that is absolutely what the acronym meant in the beginning. Wilson designed the instruction set. She wanted to create something that was powerful but simple. And then Ferber implemented those instructions as circuits, carefully simulating the results with a reference model program in 850 lines of BBC Basic. He did, however, run into an extra requirement that presented an unexpected limitation. Look, if we want any chance of keeping the educational market happy, we need to reduce cost as much as possible. Uh, wh what do you mean? What I mean is the chip has to fit on a 50 cent plastic package. It cannot have any additional expensive cooling. Any other packaging will cost 20 times more. Do you understand? Ferber was shocked by the draconian requirement to get the chip working on a plastic envelope meant that the chip will have to produce less than a single watt of heat. Additionally, the tools and models they had for calculating how much heat every element of the design will generate were really archaic and inaccurate, so he will have to estimate and leave a hefty security margin. April 26, 1995, the day everyone in the company was waiting for, finally arrives. The first samples of the first ARM chip had arrived from BLSI Technologies. After a couple of small issues in the test board are fixed, the computer's plugged in and it boots running BBC Basic. The company collectively holds its breath as a test command is timed. The command is executed and out comes the output. Hello world, I am an ARM. 
screams of victory roll through the office. A bottle of champagne is open. It works. And running extremely cool at that. Given the strict heat limits, Ferber estimates that by definition, it will also have to be really power efficient. So curious, he connects a meter to it and measures how much power it was pulling. Zero watts. What? That makes no sense. Dismayed, he discovers that the power to the processor was not even connected. But how? The processor was unequivocally working, so where in the world was it getting power from? Uh, so apparently the chip was using zero power. Now, clearly this can't happen. Um, and a bit of investigation proved that I actually failed to make the connection through to the chip. Yeah. But the chip was still executing code quite happily. Um, and, and the only explanation for this is that all chips have um, diodes on, on the I.O. pins to protect the chips from electrostatics. So if you walk across a nylon carpet carrying the chip, you're less likely to blow it up. Um, and so if there were inputs from external chips at the 5 volts, which was the, the positive rail, then that could power the chip through these protection diodes. And that must have been what was happening. The device was so extraordinarily power efficient, beyond anything that they had expected from the design, that it was running from leaked current alone. With a device this powerful and power efficient, maybe they could aim for much more than an expansion to the BBC Micro or a next generation computer. Maybe it could be something more. It will take many other twists and turns for that to become the chip inside all our phones, and we might get there in a future video, but one thing I can tell you for sure is that while ARM will become a thing, Acorn will not be as lucky. In fact, I'm willing to bet that for a good number of you viewers outside the UK, you have never heard of them before. Have you ever wondered why? Why could this incredibly forward-thinking computer never make it to markets like the US? Well, that is a story that I explored together with Professor Ferber in this month's episode of SideQuest, my side series where I explore tangential stories to the main video. And as a bonus, I'm also uploading the full interview with Professor Ferber that I recorded for this video. Particularly, I mean, I was very pleased Apple took that decision and, and you know, my MacBook Air doesn't have a fan, right? And, and of course, for the last 10 years, they've been mastering the process of building very energy efficient, powerful systems with their iPhones and then iPads. Fairly small step from a high-end iPad to a low-end Mac. And all of this is available exclusively on Nebula, a creator-owned streaming service that is, without a doubt, making the careers of hundreds of independent creators like myself. Thanks to the new initiative that we call Nebula First, I upload my new videos there often weeks before anywhere else, and every video has its own Nebula exclusive companion. Some, like this one, have two. And the best part is, we have labored to make this as accessible as possible. If you use any of my Nebula links, you will get an exclusive discount, which means that for yearly plans, it goes down to as little as $3.33 per month for an entire year of the service, and you will be supporting me direct since being a creator-owned service. A lot of that goes directly to creators, which pays for everyone that works on these videos. This channel will not exist without Nebula. So, thank you for supporting me and for supporting creators.